dial eight for watts and dialed seven for FTS. It's called the Federal Telephone System. Right. I and mean, back uh, then, um, I mean, you, you're probably all familiar with the term security through obscurity. I mean, that was a lot of it, but it, it wasn't even necessarily obscu obscurity. I mean, I mean, you um, won't find these numbers in the phone book. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, a lot of times there wasn't security. I mean, actually today, in my opinion, like a lot of what would commonly be called hacking or cracking um, is actually a lot more challenging. Um, I'll, I'll go over this, I guess, during the giveaways. Maybe I can show it now. But um, here's a book from 1985 on Microsoft Press, actually, called Out of the Inner Circle, A Hacker's Guide to Computer Security um, by uh, the cracker Bill Landreth. And he wrote this when he was 17 or 18. And it's basically chapter upon chapter of, of password guessing strategies. Um, and this, this was literally it. I mean, getting root um, back in my day was not, you know, a buffer overflow. It's like the Morse worm was 88. Uh, but like I read about that, and I was like, wow, I wasn't even on the internet. I was just dialing up PBSs, yeah. right? I met the author of that book uh, in uh, 1994, 1995. Actually, he lived in downtown LA at some uh, yeah. weekly hotel or something like that. Yeah, I yeah, I haven't heard from him for a while, um, unfortunately. I, I dug up some stuff from maybe the mid to late 90s on him. But um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily challenging um, in the way you, you think of things as being challenging today. Like, I use buffer overflows to crash boards or disconnect users, but I didn't know back then that you could actually execute your own code from the buffer overflow. Like, sort of predated that in Thomas Lopatic and, you know, Aleph ones, you know, stacking smat, stacking, smashing the stack for fun and profit. Um, that all came after, actually, I, I stopped doing stuff for the most part. Um, it doesn't mean we still didn't have a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't necessarily as complex or as much technical aptitude. Um, and a lot of it, like, I mean, John was saying even, um, with, it was friends telling friends information. Just, you know, oh, well, here's a number I found. Here's what you can do with it. Here's some tones. Um, you know, try building this. I mean, how many people in the room probably built the, the red box with the Radio Shack tone dialer replacing the crystal? Wow, I was expecting like half the audience. So. How many tried to use those little greeting cards? Yeah, those are cute. Those are cute. Exactly, exactly. And like, you know, Fry's Electronics, like the old one in Santa Clara, like the one designed like a circuit board that's closed fries like they were always sold out of those it was like such a hassle and like we'd find them and we'd buy them all out because we could give them to friends so I mean that's more my era right but I think the last known date that I know of where red boxes actually worked was the actually right here in San Diego at the public library in 1995 1996 it actually worked you could actually make a red box call but that even back then I'd say 90 percent of the pay phones they had filters in them now that you couldn't do last that. year at TGI Fridays <laughs> yeah okay Oh, okay, X25. How many people messed around with X25? Just show of hands. Okay. Um, X25. So. Oh, nice. Very nice. So DEF CON 3, that was probably after I stopped doing stuff. But, um, but X25, like, I mean, Dan and I had this talk. Like, for me, like, some people really messed around in X25. Like, for me, it was just another thing, like a hack PC pursuit account, or I just use it as an out global out dial. So I could dial in once and dial out and not have like to pay a bill. And I mean, now that's pointless, right? Like get flat rate long distance. You don't need to do that. And um, <laughs> but it was pretty useful at the time. And that was just word of mouth. Like, I don't know, I traded some wares. There was just a friend who told me the number. And in return, like I gave him a number for something later that got us internet access. Um, <laughs> Which I'll touch upon with one of my giveaways, um, just because it has a little personal You're not um, seeing what's going on the screen here, are you? Oh, oh. What's he doing? Oh, great. Well, I'll uh, reinstall OS X after I get my computer back. <laughs> so, uh, 1975 or so um, uh, was when I first got my, uh, I'll answer questions in a second, uh, was when uh, I got my hands on an Apple II computer. Um, when I, I was actually working for Wozniak at Apple Computer in a little annex building uh, next to the main building. At the time, I believe there was like about eight or nine employees there. Um, I was with Randy Wigginton and, uh, and a number of other people. Uh, Daniel Cocky was working on the hardware. And uh, I was working on a telephone interface board. Uh, I had hardware experience and I designed the circuit. And uh, my original circuit had nine chips and Wozniak cut it down to five. Uh, he's actually using part of the address line. We had a, we had a six-bit DAC, and I was using an eight-bit DAC. And said, "Well, I says, ditch the DAC. We can do it a better way." I said, "Why don't you use the two address lines, 
data lines. So therefore, I could then use a much cheaper 6-bit DAC, which was like one-tenth the cost of that 8-bit DAC. So, um, so I, I, I followed Waz's design and suggestion and, and did the circuit and got it working. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, things that I, I did was I wrote this little program that would just call up a number, right? And I put it on a little cassette tape because that was the only thing you can put your programs on was a little cassette tape because the little Panasonic recorders was, was the, our only off, off at the time. Floppy disks at that time didn't exist. So um, uh, I put the, the cassette tape on Waz's desk and says, here's a program I wrote for you. You can play around with it or whatever. And so I come back the next day, and Jobs was just on me like you couldn't believe it. He was so ticked off. I said, what's going on? Why are you so mad? And it turned out that Waz programmed the phone board on the Apple to call Jobs to the house over and over again. <laughs> and it's like... And I used it also to do some scanning, and I used it for scanning 800 numbers, and I found this 800-424-9337 number in Washington, D.C. And the guy that answered the phone was extremely obnoxious to me. I says, gee, why is this guy so mad at me calling this number? Because 800 numbers, they're, they're the one who encourage you to call them. That's why they're free. So I wrote a little question mark against there, and I said, I better check into this later. So after about uh, a couple weeks later or a week later, I uh, did some social engineering. I called the guy back up and I says, oh, hi, this is AT&T Long Lines Division in uh, White Plains, New York. Uh, we're having some translation problems on your 800 number. Uh, what number have we reached, sir? He says, uh, you've reached the CIA crisis hotline into the White House. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, sir. Click. So then I did the, uh, the 800-424-9337 mapped really to 202-456-9337. So the 202 number was, and it just so happened that very, very soon after that, they had just put in this little system called the Auto Verify. Uh, back then in 1975, TSPS was getting pretty popular at the time. It wasn't fully implemented yet throughout the whole system. But it made so that the TSPS operators would not have to call the uh, special uh, operator in a distant city to do emergency breakthroughs, because a TSPS operator could do it from anywhere now. So it turns out that uh, 202 uh, Seven two uh, followed with the uh, phone number would you have to actually be in the 202 in order to do it? So you do KP072 followed that with a regular 4569337, and that would just pop into the line. But you'd you'd hear a high pitched uh, squeal. Uh, this is because it was it was like scrambled, so you couldn't hear the conversation. Uh, but if you just gave it a little burst of 2600, it would knock off the scrambler, and you could hear the voice. <laughs> you could hear all the voice perfectly well. So we un microphone, uh, a handset of the, we listened in for a while on that line, and, uh, you know, calls, it didn't take long before a call started coming in. <laughs> so uh, one of the uh, persons said uh, something about, uh, uh, oh, uh, let's see, he said, uh, Olympus, please, and the guy says, one moment, sir, and what, what, I, what I could have swore, it sounded like Nixon coming on the line, and he says, uh, Olympus here, and then the guy says, uh, uh, answer the scramble phone right away. We've got a crisis. And then that, the conversation went dead at that point. Uh, so then I said, wow, President Nixon on that special hotline. I better write this number down. So I kind of kept it for a while and didn't really do anything with it. And then I went down to some parties or something like that a couple weeks later. And uh, some phone freaks or something like that had a, had a really cool number. And I wanted it really badly. So I says, I'll trade you. He says, what you got to trade? I says, I a crisis uh, number to the White House. He said, you got what? And I says, I got the CIA crisis hotline number to the White House. It's an 800 number. And uh, I even have the code name that will get President Nixon on the line. He says, nah, you're kidding. You're really well. Here, try it. Gave him the number. And I sat back and let these, let these other guys call up. And they, they decided that they do a little bit of a prank. So when they called up the number, uh, they said, Olympus, please. One moment, sir. And when Nixon came on the line, he says, sir, we have a national crisis on we're out of toilet paper, and we hung up. <laughs> a few weeks later, um, there was another instance. Uh, actually, it was in the L.A. Times, if I remember correctly. Um, there was a, there's an interesting uh, thing that happens when you're using 2600 signaling, especially on the old GTE exchanges. It was an end office that ended up in Santa Barbara. Uh, so if you call, like, just, just, like, not quite long distance out of Santa Barbara, but sort of like, you know, toll call, 
you'd, you'd get a little, uh, you'd, you'd blow it off with 2600, and you could like, uh, you then use single frequency to dial the last four digits of the number. Go beep, 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 beep like that, and then you can then get the, redial back the number that you just got disconnected from. So we sat there, and we just kept the 2600, we did this with two phones simultaneously. We dialed the number up with two phones simultaneously. What happens is, is we just connected the two phones together, and uh, we dialed out. And when we dialed out, one would be easy and one would be go through. We kept doing that and kept doing that. I, I'm, I'm going to interject here just because we got like a five-minute warning, ten-minute? Okay. Yeah. Um, and maybe we, we didn't get to see any Apple II stuff yet. Do you sure. want to fire that up? Yeah. Fire it up. Um, internet. <laughs> well, so let me just let me just give me 30 seconds on it. On it. Well, we're so we were telling, we, we were actually intercepting phone calls going into Santa Barbara. And we were telling people calling into Santa Barbara there was a nuclear accident. Okay, talk to me about it later. Okay. So, I mean, there, there's lots of great old techniques that maybe don't These work so much anymore. There, there, there's old techniques that still work. I mean, all the password guessing stuff in this book, unfortunately, still works on a lot of systems just because it's fucking password guessing, right? Um, which is really depressing. Like, haven't we evolved in 20, 30, 40 years? But no, we haven't. Exactly. Everyone's still an idiot for certain things. Um, <laughs> good comment. Excellent comment. Um, other things, I mean, certain things like I did, which I, I hate faxes. I wish fax machines would die. Um, it, some of you probably did this trolling technique. I know I did, where you'd you know, write some offensive message on a fax, and then you'd, you'd feed it through, and then as it came out the bottom, you'd tape it to the top, and it would just like endlessly fax this person, and like, that was a good way to piss people off. <laughs> so, um, and it would still work. It's good technique. Oh, dude, that <laughs> good times. Yeah, right. Okay, are, are we ready with the uh, Apple II stuff? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, uh, is it coming up? Is it on the screen on? I see stuff, but maybe I need to drag the window Yeah, over. I gotta drag the window over here, hang on. All right. Woo! So, um, actually the, the coolest thing about this is that I get to control my uh, little Apple II machine here with Apple Script which is sitting right here. <laughs> you, you'll notice that this is actually the worst program ever written. Uh, it's pretty much AppleScript telling uh, this guy to write uh, Apple Basic. So, uh, and I only, had, uh, only actually had time to get one of these finished because I got a lot busier uh, this last month than I thought I was going to be. So, without further ado, uh, here it goes. The, uh, Coolest part of the Apple II for me is how easily you can just draw right on the screen. Um, and uh, it's uh, going really slowly here. So while, while this is running, one thing that Damon and, and Dan were talking about, um, I mean, it's actually it's really good to do this sort of thing because it's much simpler hardware. Like, I mean, nowadays you're working on such a high level with so many and abstractions. Like, you just don't get down low and, okay, this is basic and he's doing an Apple script. But it's like, what's the next step? It's like 6502 assembly, right? So, you know, you start messing around with that, or, you know, or, sorry. The quad laser. The quad laser. That was quad way laser. too much time, and there's no <laughs> way all of you could have dodged it at once anyway. <laughs> you know, and, and there was a history, too, we don't see in hardware architecture. Like, Dan was schooling me on 68,000s, being, like, basically derived from a PDP-11. And, like, back they designed hardware. 